We're sitting with Travis Mills, Renaissance Manchild, according to your social media profile. Um, and you really are. You went from an unsigned rapper on the Warp Tour to a signed rapper, actor, music producer, podcast host, radio DJ. Everything. Am I missing anything? No, I don't think so. Human being, maybe, but that's that's about it. Yeah, you nailed it. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, your research is extensive. Uh, dude, wait, this, we're just getting started. Oh, I, I do my homework, I, my I friend. I can't wait to see what you dig up <laughs> on me, man. I'm going to just have to like duck off in a corner or something. You know what I think is cool, though, about you and a lot of like these SoundCloud rappers and stuff? And I'm not even sure you're aware of it, but like the punk rock guys of the 80s, their whole thing was DIY in the yeah. 90s too, right? Yeah. Do it yourself. No one's going to give us a record deal. We got to go fight for it. We have to do our artwork and our t-shirts and everything ourselves. And it seems like you have that same kind of philosophy to your career. To I, your definitely, life career. I definitely embody that. I grew, up on, I grew up on punk rock. I grew up on hardcore. But I also grew up on Tupac and Bone Thugs and Harmony and like the Notorious B.I.G. and Wu-Tang Clan. So it was like a culmination of all these different worlds. Um, but you know, yeah, metal and, and punk was like the, f that was what got me into music and mm -hmm. I started playing in bands, super shitty bands. Would you play guitar? No, I sang, uh, and like screamed and like did all, like just all this weird shit. Uh, and then when I hated relying on other people, mm -hmm. you know, when I was in a band with five other dudes who were like all four years older than me and had DUIs and like didn't want to come to band <laughs> practice and I was just like stuck, like sitting by myself. I was like, yo, this sucks. Yeah. Um, and when I was 17, I got a laptop and that's when I was like, oh, I can start recording recording myself um, and then I just started pulling instrumentals off of the internet and just started trying like sing over these like weird you know hip-hop pop beats um, and it was awful but you know it, I like I slowly but surely taught myself how to record mm -hmm. and you know being in a band is great because when you're 16 and you have no resources it really forces you to like think outside of the box yeah so like you know spray painting stencils on t-shirts and like you know burning our own CDs and like writing you know writing the titles on it and like trying to sell them for like three bucks outside of the show and like you know renting a van and like putting all of us in it just to drive to like Arizona for like two days and like getting paid nothing and sharing like one motel six room like that was what you know started everything and so you know when I started going on real tours and stuff I had that that background and, and you know that knowledge of, of like where I came from so it, it allowed me to be a lot more grateful for the opportunities that came my way later yeah on. I Jonah Hill had a great quote he was talking about growing up in Hollywood and his dad was I think an accountant to Guns N' Roses. He was like a money manager. Yeah, he was like a big, uh, I think he Tour was a big, something? something like that. He was either a booking agent yeah. uh, or a business manager. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but he was saying because of that, like growing up out here, showbiz was attainable because he could see it. Like, mm. okay, my dad's a business manager. My neighbor's a camera guy. Yep. Like, yeah. Like, I thought if, record deal, I thought record deals were fake. Like, I thought that only happened in movies. You, you grew know? up in Riverside, right? I grew up in Riverside. Is, so that, like, is that a whole different world than L.A.? The most famous person from Riverside was Travis Barker to me. Who Another famous drums Travis. From, from Blink-182, right? So that's why I was like, okay. So, I, I, But I didn't think it was, like, possible. Okay. And that actually led me to signing a really shitty contract when I was 19 because I didn't think it was real life. You know, some dude was like, I'll give you $1,000. You can go into this studio and record some songs. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll print some merch for you. But, like, I own 50% of everything. And I was, like, done, yeah. you know? And signed it, got $1,000, and was, like, cool, you know? And then later on when, you know, one of those songs popped off and I got Columbia Records calling me and they're, like, here's a real contract. And then I found out what had happened. I was, like, oh, shit. Um, but, you know, I, I say, like, I met all of the wrong people first mm -hmm. uh, in my career. And, and that's... That's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it sucks what happened to me, but at least it happened then instead Early. of now. Yeah. You know? um, so what was the plan after that? Go back to public school or were you no, done? No, so uh, I found this this thing. It was like called charter school where yeah. I could go. I actually started going to community college when I was 16. and so. Why, did you have super good grades? How'd you pull that up? My com well, I did have good grades, yeah. And I got the one good thing about private school is I got a way better education than all my friends, yeah. right? Like it, I was, I'm smarter than everyone I know, which is cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but then I found a charter school, and I could go to a community college, and one of my college classes... Uh, each college credit counted as two high school credits. Okay. So I was able to graduate by the time I was like 16 and a half, um, like just finished all that. And then I was going to art school and I was like, you know, 16. Are you a good artist? You draw, paint? Uh, I used to want to be a tattoo artist because okay. I thought that was the only way that you could, you know, have a ton of tattoos and, and be successful. I could see you live in the Romeo Lacoste right? lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. I, saw, I saw that interview. Yeah. yeah. Um, could have went that way. And I was going to art school, I was going to art, art classes in community college, and I was working at a Starbucks, uh, and this girl kept coming in, and 
she. So you're done high school now. You're just working at Starbucks. I was literally 16, working trying to figure it and, out. Like, but like, I was supposed to be in 10th grade still. So like, yeah. it, it was weird. It was weird. So like, here's this like 16 year old who should be in high school, but I'm working at Starbucks like the graveyard shift. <laughs> okay. You know, so I'm like, I'm like clocking in at like like two in the morning and like working till like 10 a.m. Um, and then this girl that always used to come in, I'd like flirt with her and stuff. And she had this, she had this book, this, and she went to cosmetology school and I took a look at it one day. I was behind the counter and I looked at the book and I was like, yo, this shit's easy. Like I could, I could definitely do this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the next day I quit Starbucks and was like, yo, I want to go to cosmetology school, found a cosmetology school and signed up. And it what was, was like, the plan? Did you want to do hair or makeup? Or yeah, what? I just wanted to be my own boss. And I wanted to be okay. able to have something that, you know, no one could take away from me. A I skill, could, a I could trade. Make, make my own hours. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I've always been very, like, entrepreneurial. So I wanted to, you know, start a hair company, like a, a product company. or I've, I've always, like, been into my hair. Right? Okay. Like, I always, like, had cool hair. And, yeah. Like, was, like, so. And, you know, like, experimenting. And you're wearing a hat. Exactly. <laughs> experimented with cutting my own hair and my friend's hair and stuff like that. And my hair had been like every color of the rainbow by that point. Um, and so I signed up. I signed up for cosmetology school, quit Starbucks and everything, started going full time. Um, and that's when I started my music project was like literally, you know, in my bedroom mm -hmm. in between going to cosmetology school. What are you using, like Fruity Loops or those? No, I was using the Garage time? Band and I didn't oh, wow. have I didn't even have a microphone. I was just like literally holding up my laptop, like singing into it <laughs> on like the internal mic and like there'd be spit on the screen. Um and my whole thing was I would wake up at like seven in the morning yeah. before everyone else and I would burn 200 CDs like I used to do for my band on my laptop. And I like I would I'd have like little photos of myself, you know, mm -hmm. and so I'd put those in like the little CD thing, yeah. like a little sleeve. And I'd go out to the line of kids waiting to get in Warp Tour with an iPod and headphones and put the headphones on them. The hustle is and strong. And try to sell them the CD for five bucks. Here's a free listen. List, literally. And then once I sold enough CDs on the first leg of the tour, I ordered my own merch. I spent like $400, got like a couple shirts, and then I'd go and do that. So, like, because he wasn't paying me to sell this. He's like, you can literally, you know, play here once a day and I'll mm -hmm. give you this bunk spot, but you work for me and this is what you have to do. Wow. So did you make some dough at the end of the tour? No, zero money. I mean, I made enough you just to broke like even. eat. I made enough to eat, and I made enough to like you know pay for the merch that I bought, and then like you know pay for blank CDs. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, made zero dollars. What were you selling the CDs for? Like, f like five bucks. Okay. You know. Um. And I'd sell I don't know maybe ten CDs. Yeah. You know, Twenty CDs a day. Um. And you know have to buy food and and all that stuff. So you get back from Warp Tour. I'm sure it was a cool experience too. Did you get to meet some of your heroes and some bands? I met a ton of people. I made, and you know, that's like where I made a lot of relationships, but also that's where I made, I like met my first fans mm -hmm. that would go on to, you know, come and see me every single year after that and then, you know, watch me like grow and grow and grow. Um, and, you know, made a, a ton of relationships on that tour. And I was just a kid selling t shirts. So, yeah, but I got home and literally. Did you have a plan or like? No plan. I, I just literally, I, I was going to every concert that I could. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even I don't even like remember what I did because it was oh I started booking shows on uh, on my MySpace page and and like literally I'd have to pay to play shows right mm -hmm. like I'd, I'd go and like take tickets and if I didn't sell enough tickets I'd have to pay yep and then I could go on stage um, and I kept doing that and coincidentally I had a friend who uh, his brother shot music videos and. He hit me up one day because he had just done a video for Fabulous. This, like, oh, rapper, sure. Right? Every, fabulous ton and, of hits, um, sure. And he was, like, he was like, yo, dude, we, I got all of this camera equipment, and I don't have to give it back until tomorrow. And he's like, I know that, you know, you're, you're making music and stuff. And he's wow. like, if you want to try and shoot a music video, um, here's your, here's your let's shot. do it. And I was like, dope. I was like... But I had like I had like zero you know like zero new music like from coming back like I had five songs when I went on that first tour mm -hmm. like to my name like and you period. came back with five songs and I came back with five songs <laughs> and so I was like you know I have this demo of this one song but I fucking hate it because mm -hmm. it was just a corny song um, and I was like but I've never shot a music video before let me just wow. practice you yeah. know like let's just try it um, so we went and uh, and we shoot this video and. I mean, it's cool. Nothing ha like you know, nothing happens. It, 
I just go about, you know, my, my little life and I'm, I'm just like working with people here and there and I'm recording my own music and, you know. Are you still working at Starbucks or like, no, how, how are you no. paying to get a hamburger? Or? Just selling things on the black market, <laughs> so you will, you know, okay. like I became a botanist, if you will. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I was just like selling weed and like, okay. you know, just like doing stuff like that. Little um, hustle. Yeah. Or like, you know, I'd, I'd hop on a show and I'd get paid like a hundred bucks. You know, it was tough, dude. It was, it was rough. But you're living at home. You don't have a lot of expenses. It didn't have a lot of, I had a cell phone bill. Okay. You know what I mean? And yeah. I had like, like gas and like car insurance that I had to pay for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wake up one day and the homie who I signed that contract for, for a thousand dollars to make those first couple songs. Mm-hmm ended up getting in contact with that video director, getting all of the footage, had it edited, Mm -hmm. and just, I wake up on MySpace and my shit is just booming one day, and I'm like, what is going on? And this fool did a whole campaign with Fuse, you know, Fuse TV, um, and released the music video. Without telling me, without anything, anything, puts the song out, and to this day, it's like, I, f- I hate the song. I yeah. hate the video. It's like a blessing and a curse because it's what started everything. Yeah. Uh, a song's called Stupid Boy. I f- I've, I've never, I've never played that song live. Yeah. Ever. Like, mm-hmm. not, like it's, it, it was like what started everything. Never played that song live once. Is this the bad song? It's awful. And okay. like, you know, I made it with like this dude. It was like our first time working together. And like, we made the song and it was like, cool. But like the shit we made after was way better. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it gets 100,000 views the first day. Wow. Um, and by that time, I had a manager, uh, like a se- like semi-manager in L.A., um, and I would be crashing on his couch and stuff like that. He was like a cell phone manager, like had no clients, right? He was just like some dude that like I met and was like, yo, I'm a manager. <laughs> um, and he literally, he got uh, he got an email from Columbia Records. Mm-hmm. And he they did, saw it on MySpace, they, the video? I mean, a bu- every record label saw it. Okay. And, I mean, it was 100,000 views on the first day. And so all of a sudden, he's like, yo, they, they want us to fly to New York. And I thought he was joking and yeah. shit like that. So Universal, Warner Brothers, Atlantic, and Columbia all want to meet me. What? Um, what do your parents think about this? They didn't know. Like, they, they didn't have any... They didn't have anything to, like, compare it to. Yeah. So it's, like, it's just kind of, like, empty words. Yeah. You know? It's, like, if I told, like, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. If I told my mom that, you know, I hung out with the Eagles or something, she'd be like, oh, my God, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, but sure. if I'm, like, yo, you know, I me and Lil trip- Pump just got lunch today, she'd be like, what? Yeah. You little know? what? So they have nothing to compare it to. They don't even think that the music business is a real thing. Yeah. So, like, okay, like, have fun. It's my first time in New York yeah, ev- yeah. ever, yeah. you know, besides, like, being on a bus. It's my first time on a plane in New York. Um, and we go there, and, you know, I meet with all these labels, and I, I still don't think this shit's real. I'm like, mm-hmm. when is this shit going to end? How's like, cell phone manager doing? Is he doing a good job? Uh, You know, he's, I mean, he had a band in the 90s that he, like, you know, he oh. worked with and got them a record deal. Okay. So he, like, you know, to me, he was, like, a god. I'm like, oh, this he, dude, oh, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, he's make Scooter Braun. Long... Exactly, exactly. <laughs> he's Riverside exactly. Scooter Braun. Exactly. And you know, he got me a lawyer, which is who then told me how bad the, the deal I signed with my friend was and all that. Um, and I ended up, yeah, I ended up signing with Columbia Records, um, and then like wanted to distance myself as far as I possibly could from that old music. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was like my real first official entrance into the music business. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, after that, you know, I, I started recording and, and actually, you know, making music. And 2012, Warp Tour actually invited me to go on the tour. How cool was that from selling t shirts in the parking lot? It was lot cool, to man, because, you know, I had my own tour bus. And so, yeah, and like, look, before, like, those, like, that gap of time leading up, like, I'd been touring and stuff, and that was something I always did. But it just, that was a moment where it really came full circle. Like, damn, three years ago, you know, Ke- uh, Kevin Lyman is his name who owns the tour mm-hmm. like he didn't even know that you were on like I'd hide I'd like sneak into the tent like and make sure like <laughs> security and shit like wasn't you know looking at this unauthorized performance and like like Florida that year um, the fire marshals and shit they wouldn't let me play that day cause wow. they're like it wasn't a stage or anything uh. it was just a tent yeah. and you know I had to like 
I had to like rig electrical cords and shit to make to power the PA. I brought my own PA. <laughs> so like they're like, you can't do this, it's grass field and all this shit. So like just to see, you know, that like evolution for me was really cool. And I had all my friends with me. I brought my dad on the tour for two weeks. Wow. He came on my bus. Um and he was with me every day. So that that for me was 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 really awesome. And then getting to see all those kids who, you know, I met in line mm -hmm. in two thousand nine who you sold them a, a CD exactly, for five bucks. Who were then like, you know, waiting, you know, for hours in a meet and greet line to see me again. Like that was dope. Wow. Um and yeah, I really like carved, you know, carved my teeth out of like like that whole circuit and and you know, growing up on like pop punk and punk rock and shit, it was cool to be, you know, one of the first I don't want to say Eminem was on the first year of Warped Tour, so I don't want to say oh, like wow. the first hip hop artist, but definitely in the la like in the ten years before that, there was really no, you know, hip hop or urban leaning music. Mm -hmm. um, and that year it was me, Machine Gun Kelly, G Easy, and Mod Sun, and we were like the four, you know, wow. dudes that weren't screaming and shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, all on the same Good stage. Good company. Yeah, definitely, and all on the same stage, and that's where I met all those dudes. Mm -hmm. You know, who I who I know to this day. So what happened? So the career, you're, you're blowing up. You've kind of achieved mainstream success. You've got the record deal. You're touring. Things are good. When did you decide, hey, I want to go in a different direction. I don't want to pursue rap anymore. I want to kind of do something else. Was there one thing that kind of led to that? or? Um, what's crazy is that when I was a kid, I acted. And, you know, I li lived in Riverside. That's like an hour and a half drive from L.A. So, like, just getting to an audition was an all-day, mm -hmm. you know, thing because my parents had to pull me out of school, drive me all the way to L.A. I Did you get any good parts that we'd know? Zero. No, okay. zero. <laughs> right. uh, like, d and that was another thing, you know. So, by the time, like, when I got into music, I was like, you know, fuck acting. Like, I got yeah. my ears pierced. I started stretching them. I started getting tattoos when I was 16. So, I was like, acting's done. I'll never act again, you know, because I had, like, earring, like, just crazy shit. Um, when... Yeah, 2013, 2014, I met a director who I worked on a music video, and he was he had a script, and he really liked me for it. And so I was like, oh, damn, maybe I could you know, act again. What was the script? Uh, the movie never got made, but okay. it was just kind of like, I think it, it just happened like that for spark? literally, and I, like, it just didn't even become a possibility you know, for me. Um, and then 2015, I was on tour with Ray Schremmerd. And I'd become friends with Pete Davidson, who's on the show SNL. Sure. We all know who Pete Davidson yep. is. <laughs> and uh, Ray Schremmerd. Yep. Um, and so me and Pete became friends on Twitter. And I was going on tour with Ray Schremmerd. And we had a show in New York. And uh, I was like, come to the show. Da -da 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 -da. And he was like, oh, I'm taping SNL. He's like, but you should come to SNL. Mm -hmm. So I was like, dope. So I literally play, get in a car, drive down to the city. Um, so and you're living like a Hollywood life at this time. This is 2015. Yeah, 2015, so I mean, I've like been you're... I've been touring and done you know done everything. Yeah, like you're sun. living the the life. Yeah, hanging out with celebrities and rappers and yeah, for going sure. to SNL. It's like a cool lifestyle you got going. Yeah, and that night, um, that night was the night that Kevin Hart was hosting. Okay, SNL, um, and coincidentally, it was the first night that Pete read the live from New York. It's Saturday. Like that's a big deal for any cast member there. Sure. So like he like kept the cue cards and shit like that. So like you know I'm backstage. I'm like watching all this shit happen. <laughs> I've never been to SNL. This shit's crazy. Yeah, to everybody's me. having a party. Everybody, and... and it's like you know I'm like whoa, this is nuts. And so we go to the after party. Cause and I, I heard that the Saturday Night Live after parties are the shit. Crazy, bro. Celebrities everywhere. Cra Dave, I met Dave Chappelle that night. <laughs> I met Kevin Hart that night. And like, mind you, like 2015, like I How met, old are you at the time? I was like 25. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because um, I started late. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I started music when I was 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. So like I'm 25 and I'm just tripping out and I'm like, oh shit. And um this dude walks up to our table and it's like me, Pete, someone else, and we're eating dinner. Um, I'm having like a steak. We're like drinking champagne and shit. I'm like getting fucked up. Living like Pete Diddy or something. Literally. <laughs> and um, and this dude walks up and, you know, talks to Pete and talks to, to some other people at the table and he's like, he's like, what's up, man? He's like, uh, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm a musician. And he's like, he's like, do you act or anything like that? And I'm like, uh, you sue and stuff like that. And uh, he's like, yo, come by my office. He's like, you live in L.A.? I'm like, yeah, I live in L.A. He's like, when are you back? I'm like, oh, next week. And he's like, come by my office. And, like, gives me his card. Mm -hmm. Turns out to be Kevin Hart's manager. Wow. Um, and, like, literally just came up to me because of, like, how You like your looks? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so I get back to L.A. and had a meeting. Um, and he's like, yo, you know, I think you, you do great on some projects. I want to send you out on, on some auditions. And I was like, Cool. Sends me out uh, on this audition for this Danny McBride show called Eastbound and Down. Oh, man, that's a great show. Yeah. 
Who? Uh, what character? No, 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 not Eastbound and Down. I'm I love sorry. that show. Uh, called Vice Principal. Which, I, feel, I love which, Vice Principal yeah, too. He's so awesome that's on. Danny McBride's new HBO show. Because uh, I'm a huge Eastbound fan. Oh like, fuck yeah! Like, dude, Kenny Powers is the greatest. The fucking greatest. Um, so I'm like dope. So my, literally my first. Wait, so audition, you were gonna you were, you were auditioning for Vice Principal? For Vice Principals. Um, and I was gonna play like a drug dealer in the high school. Or that's something. badass. Uh, and so I go to this audition, and the casting director there, this this woman, I think I think. I don't want to fuck her name up because she's incredible. And okay. she, she like every time I see her, she's amazing. I think her name's Kathleen. We'll insert her name here. In yeah, post. <laughs> I could be totally <laughs> yes. wrong. Um, we'll give her a shout it's out. It's been it's been a few years, but um, she's like, "Yo, you're amazing." She's like, "I just don't think you know you're you, you don't look like you're in high school. You have all yeah. these tattoos and shit." She's like, "But I have this other show that I'm casting that you're perfect for." She's like, "Come in on Monday," and uh, it was a show. It was this Netflix show called Flaked mm-hmm. with Will Arnett. And so my second audition, they're like, by the way, uh, Will Arnett is going to be in the room with you. Uh, and so I walk in, and, and Will's there, and we have an amazing audition. Um, He's got a great voice, too. Dude, so distinguished. He does a lot of commercials now, and I'm noticing. And he's the voice of Batman in the Lego movie. Is he really? Yeah, he oh. did, like, I want to say he did some car, he was, like, the voice of, like, Ford Trucks or something for yeah, GMC that's, or yeah, something. Yeah, that's Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's in the new Reese's commercial. Like, <laughs> chocolate, like he does, anytime, printing, like, printing money. anytime he, like, comes on my TV, I know it's Will. Yeah, me, like, too. Oh, I'm like, shit. wait, oh, shit. Uh, he's selling Reese's Pieces, okay. And, you know, when we'd be shooting the show, like, right before a scene, he'd start talking to me like he was Clint Eastwood mm-hmm. and just, like, try to fuck with my head. <laughs> Um, so that was really dope. But anyways, we have the audition. It goes really well. They bring me back. Uh, were you in a scene with him in the audition? Yeah. So oh, we, wow. Like, you know, all, pretty much all of my scenes in the show are with Will. Okay. Um, Which show was this for, the for, audition? It's called Flaked. Okay. Uh, and so they bring me back, and I had a director a director session. So the, the director's there. The producers are there. Netflix is there. Have you done Never. No, this kind of no. stuff? No. So, like, I'm this literally... This seems like real Hollywood I'm shit. I'm, like, walking in, and I'm like, fuck, you know, like... Okay. Uh, like this is the major leagues. Yeah, and had a great audition. I ended up getting the part. Um, and at the same time, is this a recurring thing, or is this like a couple episodes? Or I gotta uh, see no, the show. I, I was a, show. I was a series regular on the show. What's it on? And is it on Netflix? It's on Netflix. Yeah, I gotta check so it out. We did two seasons. Okay. Um, and and yeah, we you know we we shot the show, and it was about Venice, uh, Venice Beach, and I lived there for three years. And okay. So, I was, you know, I was, like, super, super into it. And we got to shoot on Abbot Kinney and, like, oh, all nice. these cool restaurants that I'd actually go to. Um, and that was my, you know, my first kind of dive uh, into the into the acting world. Mm-hmm. So the rap career was kind of on hold now? You're like, No, it definitely wasn't on hold. But at the same time, uh, I had been approached by Zane Lowe and mm-hmm. my friend Julie Pilot, who were at... Uh, you know, now explain were, who Zane Lowe is. People Zane, might not know. So what's crazy is that in 2013, I had a sing. 2012 and 2013, I had singles, uh, and I found out about Zane Lowe because he had this show on BBC, yeah. on Radio One. And I mean, Zane is like the dude. He yep. is like the who's who of music. Like the only Kanye interview. Rick Rubin the at his only, house. The only like like the Eminem interview. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he gets the biggest stars to talk about whatever it Great is. Great interviewer. And you know he's kind of like the tastemaker. On on what is amazing musically. And so I knew Zane from him playing my records on, on Radio 1. That'd be a big um, moment dude, when Zane's playing your records. Oh, dude, I I, call, I remember we had like a phone interview because he was obviously in the UK and, and I was just so nervous just to talk to him, you know? And just to hear him like co-sign me and, and, you know, be like, this record's fire. Like, to me, that shit was crazy. So right before Flaked, uh, he left Radio 1 he went to Apple Music, and at the time, this is all hush hush. No one knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friend Julie Pilot was working at Apple and Beats by Dre. Okay, and she used to be uh, she used to be the head of Kiss FM. So I'd oh. known her from you know my music radio time. insider. And we had had a great relationship. Like she would fly down to Seattle. Uh, she was from there, and at any time I'd play there, she'd fly there, and like we'd hang out and go around the city and stuff together, and she'd come to the show. Um, and they were like, hey. We're doing something new at Apple Music and Beats by Dre, uh, and we want you to come in because originally they were just gonna have you know influencers and celebrities and artists kind of fill in these these breaks for like an hour and be like, hey, this is so and so. Here's this song, doom. Mm-hmm. And so I went in for like a test run of that, and um, they heard you know my thing. And look, I've always been super comfortable doing interviews. Anytime I go to radio stations, they'd always be like, you know, you're a fucking pro, you're yeah. a natural, and I'd be like, this is the easiest thing. This I've is ever easy, done. yeah. yeah. And um, 
And so I, Zane heard my break and called me. Now you had no experience in radio. Zero. The Never only experience I DJ had was the only, on the other only side. experience I had was showing up and talking about my songs. Yeah. You know, and hoping that they play them and shit. But it was never a dream of yours to become a DJ God, no, or God, be in no. radio no, or anything. No. Um, and he's like, hey, you know, heard your break. He's like, you're incredible. He's like, I I want you to have your own show. And I was like, okay. And this is in 2015. <laughs> like Beats One wasn't even announced yet. Um, and so. We had, you know, so when we launched, I had this request show on Beats One. It was called Request with Travis Mills. Okay. And it was two hours a day, Monday through Thursdays. It was live, completely live. Uh, That had to be fun. Super fun. And I'd take requests from all over the world, and I'd bring in artists, you know, live. So, I I mean, I had, like, literally everybody on the show. And I was friends with all, I had G-Eazy on, I had Ty Dolla Sign on, you know, I'd have Travis Barker on, I'd have YG on, I'd have Demi Lovato, I'd have, like, Carly Rae Jepsen. It was literally an eclectic group. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I I did this. I did that show for, like, seven months, and then that was the time that I got the flaked. Uh, You know, I'd gone on the tour, Mm -hmm. and I got the flaked offer, so I left. Uh, I left Beats One. Was the Beats One thing at the time, was that more of a hobby? That wasn't, like, a real good paying gig, was it? It was definitely, like, like a a step into a new space, and, you know, it turned it out to be a lot more time than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. You know, I just put out an EP, and, you know, I was trying to tour it and stuff. I booked the Netflix show, and so that took me out for, like, a month. So I was like, yo, I'm going to step away from this. Um, You know, I love you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, hit me up if there's anything else in the future. Um, Shot the Netflix show. Came back, I was recording, 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 uh, I'd go on some tours, um, and yeah, it was just like, damn, I want to do something, you know, like something that, that I want to do, and I want it to be fun and crazy, and I want to feel fulfilled, um, and so I shot a pilot and created this, like, kind of show. Mm-hmm. Um, Video? It was a video show, yeah, and uh, it was called ADD with Travis Mills. Okay, uh, and you know, not to be confused with ADHD not, with Travis that, Mills. This is why my life is just like like all of my mistakes <laughs> turn into turn into wins later. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to learn from them first. So I shot this like you know fifteen minute pilot. What was it? It was like it was sketches, um, live performances uh, from your artists, comedians. Um, and, like, reacting to, like, funny things on the internet in real time. Okay. So it was kind of like a hybrid, you know, I I wanted to create, like, the new school TRL. Okay. In that sense. Um, And, you know, I mean, like, the pilot, like, Vic Mensa's in the pilot, Rita Ora's in the pilot. Oh, wow, you weren't fucking Uh, around. No, 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 like, you know, I mean, we probably spent, like, $75,000, like, shooting this, like, 15 Who, you did yourself? Who who Uh, And the dude who created TRL. Oh, uh, so so you had some backers. So I, I went and had a production company like sign oh, on. No shit. And, you know, our goal was to like sell this show. So this we, wasn't you with a buddy in a garage. No, it wasn't like us in like an iPhone, like you know, be like, hey, let's shoot the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is like a real deal. Like you know, I had a crew and you know everything like that. We rented out like a crazy space, mm-hmm. um, and it took us like two or three days to shoot. Um, and so we took that pilot, brought it to MTV, brought it to MTV Two, brought it to VH1, brought it to Spotify, brought it to Snapchat. Uh, brought it to Apple Music. I had a meeting with Jimmy Iovine. Literally, whoa. everybody... Whoa, 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 pause there for a sec. What's it like sitting down across the table with Jimmy fucking Iovine? I mean, look, here's the thing. I'm a little jaded because I've literally, like, you know, when I was getting signed, like, Lior Cohen, I was, like, in, a, in you know, in, like, the studio with Lior. Like, so I, I had had legends meetings. in the music business. I had had some crazy heavy sure. meetings, you okay. know? Okay. Jimmy is incredible, but I never like I never like rolled in and like try. I one Jimmy never tried to sign me. Mm-hmm. Um, Interscope never tried to sign me, and so that was my first time. I'd met him at like a industry party before, but I'd never like sat with him. Okay, so walking in to like show him my pilot, I was like, oh fuck, you know. And he ended up being like the fucking coolest dude ever, man. Yeah. And you know, gave me you know an hour and a half of his time. Well, started out he's a real musician. He was an engineer. Exactly. I mean, and you know, he was asking me my opinions on like you know, I think I think it was like the like some 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 music event had happened, like the night before or something, and we were talking about it. Mm-hmm. He was brutally honest, which I totally loved, and like it was cracking me up. Um, and so we show we show him the pilot, and he's like uh, he's like yo, this is amazing. This is amazing, and he's like, "But uh, he's like, but just wait till November." And so we're all like, oh, "Okay." When when was this? And this is in like this is in like May. Okay. You know, so it's like a, a lot, like you know, five six months. Yeah. We're trying to sell this show and like get it going. I like, mind you, I put everything on hold for this. Mm-hmm. Like, 
I'm not doing, I'm not touring. I'm like in the studio, but like I'm really focused on, on getting this show. So what was the dream to be on MTV? Uh, yeah, like my dream was either to to uh, to sell it to Netflix mm -hmm. or to sell it to MTV. Um, and at the same time, MTV was rebooting TRL, so they were like not interested. They're like, they, and like this is when they were using the influencers and stuff. Exactly, in TRL. and okay. they want you know. Then they were like, maybe you could host TRL, and I was like, uh, I want to do this show. Yeah, and then I went and met with MTV too, and it was like, uh. Um, but like literally everybody told me no, like snap, like they were like, no, 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 pass, 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 pass. Jimmy's like, oh, wait till November. We might have technology like there for the show and shit. So but just you know, on that real quick, sorry to interrupt, but this again is your entrepreneurial DIY. Definitely. Hustle going. 100%. Like you didn't sit around on your hands and wait and go, I want to show, you know, maybe they'll call me one day. You go, exactly. fuck this. I'm going to go shoot it myself. I'll get the pilot. I'm yes. going to go out and knock on doors and try to go sell it. Yes. I think that's great advice to you know, your younger fans out there who are aspiring hip hop artists or entrepreneurs or whatever. Oh, dude, I've been, like, you got to get after it. I've had the door shut on, like, on my face so many times. And it's like, you know, for, for like the 99 no's, all it takes is the one yes. Yep. And, you know, and that'll, you know, make or break their life. Um, and so when we walked out of the meeting, you know, the, the production company, everyone, I mean, to them, it was like, all right, that's a wrap. We're not going to sell this show. Let's move on to other projects. Yep. Um, and so I just kind of like went about, you know, my like my life and my life for like the next like four or five months. And what does that mean? So there's no day job. I was recording. Oh, you okay. know, I was I was, you know, just playing like shows here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like really, I want I was in to, limbo. Yeah, I was like I was definitely in limbo. Um, and this is now like, yeah, this is like 2016 now. OK. Um, around that time, I met uh, I met this kid, Lil Peep who was a fan of mine from, you know, the Warp Tour days and all of that. And I found his music and I was a fan of him. I didn't even mm -hmm. think he knew who I was. Um, and I had a... How'd you connect with Little Pete? On Twitter. I followed oh. him and I liked a tweet and he I got a DM saying, bro, how the fuck do you know who I am? Oh, no and I was shit. like, yo, I love your music. I sent him my number and I was like, hit me up whenever. Uh, and he just FaceTimed me as soon as... Like, that's pretty bold to do. Like, you know, he just yeah. FaceTimed me as soon as I sent him my number, like, not even a minute later. Like, you want to play it cool a little bit, like, wait a couple days normally? Or, like, yeah, I thought he'd, like, text me and be like, yo, yeah. lock me in, you know, let's hang out when I'm in L.A. Fucking balls out FaceTime call. Yeah. Not even a phone call, FaceTime. And um, just to give a little backstory on that, you know, with my music, too, like, I was working, uh, you know, with my best friend Adam, and he was managing me, and he was at this management company with this woman, Sarah Stennett, and Sarah's like this huge music manager from the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, she manages Rita and you know Ellie Goulding oh, and wow. at the time Zayn Malik and Iggy Azalea and all these you know crazy artists. And you know she took me to dinner one night and she was brutally honest with me. She's like, "Look, I'm not interested in managing you as an artist." <laughs> Thanks. She's like, "I don't you know don't believe in you musically." And I, I was appreciate like, that. She's like, "But she's like, I really trust your taste and your opinions." And she's like, "If you ever find an artist that you love uh, mm -hmm. or you know." an act that you really want to sign, she's like, let's do it together. Mm -hmm. And literally a week later, I met Peep. So, like, having that dinner with her that night, I hated her. Like, I, it yeah, was how like, shitty was that when you left? Oh, dude, I, I, like, cried. Like, I was like, you know, it was the worst. To me, it was like, I was like, fuck that. She doesn't know anything. But, like, you know? yet she's a respected person in the business. Literally. She's telling you basically you're not good enough. Not, not good enough for her, you know? But, like, she was like, I think you're going to be huge. But, like, I think, like, I, tr like, you're going to be huge as Travis, not as, like, T-Mills. Okay. You know? And she's like, you have so much more to offer. And to me, I didn't want to hear that shit, you know? I just wanted her to be like, yeah, let's fucking do it. You're you the know? greatest ever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I love you. So it definitely checked my ego. Um, and coincidentally, I met Peep a week later, and... How old was Peep at the time? He, was, he must have been young. Oh, right? dude, like 18 or 19. Okay. Um, He was, like, 18 or 19. What kind of music was he making at the time? I mean, he had just put out uh, this song called 19. Okay. Um, which is my favorite Pete song. And then he had this song called Beamer Boy uh, before that. And he was part of this, this like, rap group before. Um, and, you know, I was... I f yeah, we started... I met him when he had, like, 3,000 followers. Like, that's how I, like, classify dates and shit, is, like, by <laughs> following. Um, and I'm talking to him... And that conversation with Sarah clicked in my head, mm -hmm. where she's like, "He didn't have a deal or anything yeah, at the time. He was just like well, a SoundCloud guy." Yeah, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" He's like, oh, "I'm at, I'm I'm at my parents. I'm at my mom's house in Long Island, New York." And I was like, "You want to come to LA?" And he's like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Cool. Send me all your information. I'm gonna get you a flight." Mm -hmm. So I called Sarah and I'm like, "Yo, I got the guy. I need I need 
money to fly to, like, give me your credit card information. <laughs> and I flew him out literally mm-hmm. the next day. Um, and, you know, I brought him to the company and, and pretty much all I did was gave him resources and mm-hmm. an opportunity, um, you know, to, to pursue his artistic vision. Like, I, I, I just connected him with certain people and, you know, he was like, I want, gr- I want a pink grill. Had the grill person come over, mold his teeth, you know, and we paid for it. Got him a house in L.A., paid mm-hmm. for it for a year. Um, you know, he wanted flamingos in his music video. We got <laughs> fucking ten flamingos. You know now, what I mean? Now, is he an artist? I mean, that sounds like crazy Dude, out there a, shit. He like, was, true artists are like that. He I was, want fucking flamingos. You know, he, and what's crazy is, like, he reminded me of me when I was 19, mm-hmm. but just, like, in an even crazier way. And, like, part of me was, like, jealous, not jealous, yeah. but, like, damn, like, I wish I could be as free as this kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like I had my, I had so much, like, admiration for him. Um, and, you know, he he didn't believe in the music business either. He's like, mm-hmm. yo, there's people that will, like, do all this shit. You know what I mean? Like, I could shoot a, you know, $60,000 music video. Mm-hmm. And so all I did was believe in his ideas, um, you know, and just kind of... But why, at the same time, you're an artist yourself. You know what's crazy? Why you want to know why it? I did it? Yeah. Because I started following Gary V around that time, and Gary has this quote saying, uh, if I can put myself out of business, then I win. So what does that mean? If if I own if I own Coca-Cola, okay. right? And I know that Diet Coca-Cola, like let's pretend they're two separate companies, sure. right? And, and I know that Diet Soda is going to be the next big thing, and it's going to crush regular soda. Yep. Or let's say I own Coca-Cola, and energy drinks are becoming the new thing. If I can buy Red Bull yep. before Red Bull has enough money to buy Coca-Cola, yeah. I win. Yeah. If Red Bull puts Coca-Cola out of, comp- out, out of business, I own both of them. Yep. So it's like, who's losing here? Yeah. Because event and music and anything. There's I always going to be somebody else. It's just, it's age and it's timing. And it's like, there's always, you know, there's 15 year olds right now that are going to be yeah. mega famous next year. Yep. That a 35 year old is going to have no chance competing against. No. So like if I can get in now mm-hmm. and, you know, help this young artist and like put maybe my shit to the side, then who, who's losing? That's a pretty more mature way. I guarantee if you put 10 artists in a room, nine wouldn't have done that. Nine would have go fuck That's him. Where I, I want to like... keep, I want to keep him down. I, he's, I'm threatened by him. Yeah. I'm going to keep him at bay so I can keep coming up. Yeah, I think that that that's just like the famine mentality, mm-hmm. you know, like th- like there's not enough for everyone. Like I need it all for myself. Yeah. And I mean, for me, it was just like, yeah, if, if you know, I, I'm not gonna be the most popular dude forever. So if I can contribute to someone else's success, wow, that's you know gonna be. And I think that's where my entrepreneurial like bra- like side of my brain kicked in, mm-hmm. um, because my ego definitely wasn't at the forefront there. <laughs> sure. You know, um, and so start working with Peep. Um, so what are you doing for him at the time other than getting McGraws nothing, and Flamingo? Just literally, yeah, just like creating opportunities, you okay. know, connecting him with, with stylists and, you know, sending him to Fashion Week. But and, he doesn't have any money at the time, right? No, how's, he, I mean, how's he paying for all this? Literally, like, you know, got in business with us. And, oh, I got you, okay. You know, uh, and, I mean, v- dude, it all happened so fast because mm-hmm. he's, he's so talented. Like, you know, he started selling out merch and started, you know, went on tour. His first tour in Russia was sold out. And So were you getting a piece of, you were in the no, little no, no, business? No, 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 I mean, I, I brought it to Sarah. Um, I didn't do anything for the money there. Oh, okay. You know, but like what I had was I had a woman who was well-established in mm-hmm. the industry and who had, you know, belief in me. And I've always said, like, money doesn't make you rich. Relationships make you rich. True. So if I have a woman who's willing to invest in me and my ideas, I'm good. Yeah. Um, and, and you're learning from her at the same time how to, how to take an unsigned artist and kind of turn it into something. And, uh, and, you know, I saw, like, a lot of myself in Peep, and I didn't want him to get fucked over like I did when I was his age. So I was very protective. In that and sense. pass along the stuff you learned. Literally, like, I was just, like, there to talk and, like, there to, like, you know, yo, if you need something, always hit me up. Um, and then what we were able to do in a very short amount of time was, was really cool. At the same time, uh, Zane Lowe starts texting me and is like, yo, man, let's have dinner, let's catch up, you know, da-da-da, I haven't seen you in forever. Um, and so he comes over to the house, and he's like, hey... You know, uh, it'd be amazing to have you back, uh, you know, at Beats. And I was like, dope. I'm just, you know, I have this pilot that I shot. Show him the pilot. He's like, cool. Bring it back in. Um, ended up 
starting my Beats One show, mm-hmm. you know, and this is like the beginning of 2017 now. Okay. Um, and developed that for a few months, and then in May we went live, and I've been on. Oh, it was the end of 17, and then so yeah, beginning of 2018, my show, you know, went on, and been doing it ever since, man. What's up with the video? Are you? Is that still in the mix? I have the pilot, but you know, uh, the format changed a little bit. Couldn't call it ADD. Okay. Um, Why not? With the corp- like, just because like they, they thought it was like uh, insensitive. Oh, you know. Jesus. And and I ha- I have you know I have it. Me too. But when I started my podcast, mm-hmm. it came full circle because I was like I need a title for my I was gonna call it like right now with Travis Mills or I was gonna call it something so, so stupid. Yeah. And I'm like ADHD. I'm like. It's been Perfect. right in front of me, like, this whole time. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I mean by, like, every little thing in my life is like, led up to a culmination, of, you know. Yeah. It's, it's been a culmination of, like, all of my good ideas, bad ideas, unexecuted ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, what led to the podcast? How did that come? I just, I've always wanted... Because I've heard, I've heard you and talk about it. You kind of look at the Joe Rogan. You're a big fan of him. Is there any other people Definitely. in that world you kind of... I mean, Chris D'Elia, Theo Vaughn. Uh, Theo Vaughn's Theo, great. Theo and Brendan have a crazy podcast. Uh, Dax Shepard has an amazing podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just really fell in love with the medium. Yeah. You know? And like... You were a fan? Yeah, and I just got like so burnt out on listening to music all day, every day. Especially, I play so much music on my show. Mm-hmm. I'd be in the studio for 12 hours, and when I get out, I wouldn't want to listen to music. Yeah. And and so, I really fell in love with podcasts, and you know, I'd, I'd always said like oh one day I'm gonna do this one day I'm gonna do this um, and then I started being asked to be a guest on podcasts okay and so after I did like two or three podcasts I was like I found myself just being like more present than the person interviewing me on mm-hmm. the podcast and I was like what do you mean by that just like I was dominating the conversation sure you know, I was inter- you were interviewing I, them not interview but I was leading I was the like, conversation I, it was yeah it was it was my combo to be had yeah and I was like yo this is I'm really like you know missing an opportunity here um, and plus and, you do this I mean this is a skill set you've built my whole beats life. your yeah, really exactly. your whole life I mean look if you're a hairdresser they always say like you know you're your client's therapist it's like a bartender exactly yeah because uh, all you do is you know listen and, and talk um, so you know, and my Beats One show, I play, I play music, and it's very music centric, mm-hmm. and it's what I'm listening to. How long to are your talk breaks? How long do you get? Cool. I mean, it's an hour show. But I mean, like every like when you open the mic, how long do you? Oh, have I to talk, talk whenever I want. But oh. how, but how long? Usually a minute, two minutes. I mean, you're not talking for 15 minutes. No, at a time. the interviews will be probably like eight to ten minutes. Okay. Um, and then I'll talk in between, in and out of songs. Okay. You know, and I'll have two to three artists every episode. Okay. So it's very packed. It's sure. like it's boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Um, and then which the is pop- what you need for a show like that. Hundred percent. Fast moving. And that's why I wanted to call it ADD, you know, or ADHD. <laughs> uh, and and then the podcast, you know, I wanted something where I could just sit down with somebody that I had a good relationship with and mm-hmm. that I knew, you know, could could really have a good conversation and just just talk. Let it fucking rip. And yeah. Have no boundaries. Have no, you know, rules. Uh, there's nothing that's off limits. Mm-hmm. Um. And once again, pointing back to Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, crazy thing is too is I love I was, that inter- I love that interview by the way. Thank you. And when I was on that Ray Shremmerd tour with Pete and how do you Ned, say that? I'm old. How, Ray Shremmerd. I, I always thought it was Ray Strummond. No, does Ray everybody Shremmerd. say that? It's ear drummers backwards. Ear dr- Oh no shit. Ear drummers is Mike Will's. Mike Will made its record label. Okay. And he signed them. Okay. And so it's ear drummers backwards. Oh okay, really? Yeah, Ray Shremmerd. Uh, when I was on a tour, me and Gary, I followed him on Twitter, and he hit me up. Uh, and, and you were just like, a fan. You listened to him. Just a fan, dude. I was a musician. You know, I was I was just watching his videos. I was really depressed at the time. No offense, but how does a rapper musician even get into Gary V? He's kind of a business kind of a just guru kind of once guy. Once again, my entrepreneurial side of my. You brain. just love that hustle. How, how to build my business? How yeah. to you know how to you know just do whatever. Um, and so Gary hit me up and was like, "Yo, really love what you're doing. Wow. Um, if you're ever in New York, you know, hit me up. Just so happened I was going to New York." Uh, for Fashion Week and, and all this shit. So we were supposed to hang out. Couldn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, he canceled? No, he set aside He set aside like a block of time for me. And this was at the time when he was like giving people like five minute meetings. <laughs> he was like, yeah. all of his vlogs were like, he would schedule like literally five minute meetings. Yeah, yeah. And so he gave me like 15 minutes and that to me was like, oh my God. Yeah. Um, and something came up and it didn't work. But I was in New York and... I walk into the sushi restaurant to have a meeting with, with someone, and he's at the bar. Hmm. And so I'm like... Just by himself? 
he's waiting for for a dinner meeting to go okay. to. Yeah. And tap him. I didn't think he's gonna know me. He's like Travis. I'm like, dude, so yeah. nice to fucking meet you. He's like, yo, I know we're supposed to you know hang out and stuff. He's like, but we're gonna you know we're gonna make it work. You know, yeah. da, 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 da. So we, we actually met each other by accident, um, in like 2016. And then yeah, like I think last year. I had just said, like, fuck this, dude. I'm going to start the podcast. You know, I'd been a guest on, on some podcasts, and mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to do it. It's, it's It seems like a good fit, because it's the exact opposite thing you do during your day job. Definitely. Everything else is timed out, planned out. We got to get this. We got to get in this song. We got to get out of that song. We got to get to this interview, blah, blah, blah. With a podcast like we're doing right now, you can just talk forever. Yes. Make it short. Make it long. Talk about shit. Curse. Yep. You know, do whatever you want. Um, and coincidentally, again, I'm eating sushi with my girlfriend. And Gary texts me, and he's like, yo, I just launched this new wine business. Mm-hmm. And before, uh, backtrack a little bit, when I was thinking of the idea of the podcast, I wrote down a dream list of guests. Gary was at the top. Okay. Um, Who else was on the list? Uh, Gary, Chris D'Elia, um, David Dobrik, um, Gabby Hanna, Zane Hijazi, um, Shmeek Moore. Literally You've every- had all these I've guests, literally right? had every single person besides one person that I've, I've written down on my list. Wow. Yeah. Um, Cody Co and you know and he's you coming on. Coming. Yeah, he's coming on. Uh, and so I've literally Theo has not done my podcast yet, and that's the one person that that's on my list that he hasn't will. that hasn't come on. Theo, hook him up. Yeah, come on. Um, crazy story about that though. Uh, and so Gary texts me and he's like, "Yo, I just launched a new wine company." He's getting into the twenty dollar bottle Empathy of wine, wines. right? Yeah. Um, and he's like, "It mean the world, uh, you know, if you could support." So I'm at dinner with my girlfriend. Most people would look at the text and be like, okay, cool, I'm at dinner, Yeah, you know? I read the text, and Gary's always been a solid dude. I've always respected his, his work and, you know, all, all the shit he does. So I said, you know, hold on one second. Mm-hmm. I need to do something on my phone. <laughs> Pulled out my wallet. So you're not the dick boyfriend at dinner on your phone the whole time? No, no, okay. no, no. So I told him, I'm like, yo, just give me two seconds. Nice. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna respond to this text. Mm-hmm. And um, she knows how big of a fan of Gary I am yeah. and everything. And so, uh, and so I pulled out my phone. And I ordered two cases of wine and, you know, sent it back to Gary. Not expecting anything. Mm-hmm. He was like, dude, thank you, brother. I, you know, appreciate you so much. Two weeks later. Uh, Is that what he meant? I, I took the text to something else. Like, can you please support this, like, venture? I, th- I took it to mean, like, could you promote it or could you talk about it? He was looking for sales. I don't know if he was looking for sales. I don't know what he was looking for. I think he was just kind of like texting his homies and being like, "Yo, this is, this is what I'm shit doing. I'm doing. You know, anything, uh, anything you could do to support, uh, oh, you know, cool. I'd appreciate it." And um, me and Gary, had, I had him on my Beats One show before the podcast. What was the connection there? Why was he on that? Uh, he was on there promoting, I think, his book. Okay. Um, and and then after that, I mean, we talked on the phone every day. Like he would call me. Uh, Oh, he was dropping a shoe collab, too. K-Swiss. Yeah. So we would just talk on the phone literally fucking every... He'd, he'd send me music. He'd be like, what do you think of this? What's crazy is, and I talked to him, I interviewed him, too, is the hip-hop connection. Because I'm an older guy, yeah. too. And it's like, when are you too old to talk about young rappers, right? But Gary kind of proved that you can do other things. Like, Definitely. he doesn't have to be business guy. Yeah. He doesn't age out of something. He's like, I'm fucking listening to this new, yeah. you know, whatever I record. Now yeah. we're going to talk about entrepreneurship. Now 100%. I'm going to talk about little. I think it all just ties into you know his whole brand and like his whole message. And now the know? Jets. It's very organic. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, cool. and then like two weeks later, I'd set a date for my first episode, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, but uh, I texted him and I was like, "Yo, man, I'm launching my podcast. Would love for you to be a part of it." He's like, "Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send you some dates when I'm available." Um, it's getting closer, you know, to the time where I got to record. And um, and I, you have no like backup plan. I got no plan. You just like fuck. I hope Gary texts me back. Like yeah, and I was just like kind of sending out feeler texts, like, mm-hmm. hey man, not to him, but just to, like a couple okay. friends, and like, hey man, you, you know, might be starting this podcast, maybe <laughs> if it's convenient for you. Um, and I woke up and I got a text from his assist. Oh, I got a text from his assistant. I got a DM from Gary and a DM from his assistant on my Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I thought, like, something that happened. I woke up to, like, oh, shit. And it was, yo, T, I'm in L.A. today. I leave at 10 p.m. Flight got canceled. Let me know if you want me to do the podcast. Wow. So I'm like, oh, shit. So I call, like, the studio, you know, for my podcast. And I'm like, I need everything set up tonight. I need the (laughs) lights. I need the mics. Da-da-da-da-da. And we made it happen. And he was supposed to fly to Chicago. They had a snowstorm. Mm Mm-hmm. 
flight got canceled, so he was stranded in L.A. Okay. And um, and he came and, and did the first episode. Wow. And that's a great episode. You guys should check that out. Thank you. It's kind of neat how you take diverse people, because your fan base may not know who Gary is, so you do one with Gary. Yeah. Then you do one with Gabby Hanna. Yep. Then you've got your girlfriend in. Then I want to talk about your solo ones too. That was interesting. Like I listened to that, the one you did right before, right around Christmas. Yeah, I did that. I was doing homework. I did a, like an end of the year, uh, like a year in review. Yeah, how all those YouTubers do it. Yeah, but I did it like podcast edition. Yeah, it was really yeah. cool. And um, is that hard for you to do? Because like when you're doing your beat show, it's you. Like you've got a real purpose, right? I got to get out of the song. I got to tease the interview coming up, and I got to talk about this next song I'm mm-hmm. playing. Whatever. It's kind of it's kind of structured. Podcast is looser when you're interviewing somebody, but there's still kind of some structure, some things you want to hit. Yeah. When it's you by yourself, that's a different thing than interviewing somebody. Definitely. This is a lot easier to me than looking at that camera and talking. I I think that's hard as fuck. Like I don't know how these YouTubers do it. How like how did you do it? The first time on your podcast, were you nervous or? No, I wasn't nervous. Uh, was it a different skill to learn? The, I think the hardest thing for me to do was like write down everything that I did that year. You know? Okay. Like, oh shit! Like in chronological order. Yeah. You know? So I like wrote out the months. Yeah. And I was like, "What the fuck happened?" Because my memory sucks. ADHD. Literally, and and I just kind of had to like pick, you know, pick moments. Um, what advice? Because a lot of people are starting podcasts every day. I mean, there's more. I mean, there's literally. I mean, there's millions. You know that, like, I, w- I want to say, like, ninety percent of podcasts that get started don't go past episode seven. You know, I heard the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, episode w- seven. They all they all stop. What is it about? How seven. many episodes do you have? I'm on, I think fifteen. So you're fucking week. home free. Oh, the seventh week, I was so <laughs> scared. I was like, dude, if I don't fucking get this podcast, I'm doomed. Yeah. Uh, and that was a big thing when I started, like, cause I, you know, and yeah, like, I think I want to say some crazy percentage. What is it about your podcast? Or so what's why? I think the it's consistency, episode? man. Yeah. I think it's like, people are know, jacked up at first. Oh, that's with anything. You yeah. know, people are super excited at first and they don't see results that they want after four weeks. And so they're like, fuck this. This yeah. isn't worth it. You know? Yep. And like so one thing back to Gary, man. What? It's just do it for four years and yeah. then come back to me. Yep. Do it every, every day, day for four years and yep. then come back. Yep. What makes a good interview? What makes a good interviewer? Because um, you're a good interviewer. Not look. I think there's one thing about being prepared. I by the way, I don't do, I don't write down questions. I don't yeah, throw those away. You know they've been sitting on the table the whole fucking time. Uh, but I do this as an outline. It's like I have an idea of how I want to kind of the conversation to go. And this is more just the crutch. If no, and I noticed. I saw that you had them. and You haven't picked them up. Once, I haven't picked them up cool. one time. I think yeah, yeah like do you. I, and I noticed you don't have any notes at all. None. No, so, like, I don't want, like, I think being able to react to the conversation, because I could tell you something about, like, pudding, you know, and I'm like, I love chocolate pudding, yeah. and if you're like, but tell me about your first single, <laughs> tell me like, about Riverside. it's gonna be fucking weird, yeah, dude, talk fucking you know, pudding. like, like, go, like, being able to actually be in the conversation, be present, and, and you know, uh, just respond, and, and, and react, that's, that's the most important mm-hmm. thing. And what else? I mean, length of podcast doing prep work I mean like how much prep work do you do zero the no most shit. prep I do is that's bad ad- podcasters that's bad advice do some fucking homework well, I'm self-aware, I did homework. I did I'm homework. self-aware enough to know that I'm good at what I do <laughs> you are good at what you um, do but how do you not do homework because well, you're interviewing with people you already know and are familiar I've with? interviewed I've had three guests on the podcast who I'd never met before Okay. Like us meeting was the first time you know was in the studio yeah. meeting for the first time um, and that's how I get to know them. All right. Well, listen, you said it all. Dude, thank you so much. It was much, a pleasure, man. man. Yeah. Really nice sitting down with you. Everyone check out his podcast, ADHD, with Travis Mills. Check him out on YouTube. Check him out on Beats One. Check him out in life.